It's Corporal Jeff Bartholomew's job to keep the causeway safe. And one thing standing in the way of that, tailgating. Watch the car behind the white car. When he moved over to the left lane, he was extremely close. It's something that Bartholomew sees all too often. In some instances, you know, six feet away from each other, when the people are, you know, driving 60, 65 miles an hour during rush hour, and that's just, that's really no time to react. It's been a rough year on the causeway. Accidents have killed four people, and police say that tailgating is one of the main causes. One of the problems we're seeing here is that people are not driving ahead. They're not seeing the roadway ahead of them. The problem starts with a stalled car. Even if the first car can swerve, if the second car is too close, a crash is coming. And that's why Causeway Police are going to increase enforcement of tailgating. We feel that uh, with the proper education, proper enforcement, it will be safe. So if cops are going to crack down on tailgating, that brings up the inevitable question of how far back do you need to be? There is a mathematical formula, but it's kind of complicated. There's also an easy way to figure it out. For every 10 miles an hour, it's one car length. For sports fans, the analogy might be to make sure that you keep 30 yards between you and the goal line. We want to enforce it where there's a gross neglect. It's a crackdown that even motorists agree with. Get them all. This is spring break without the beach. You might not think of New Orleans as an Easter weekend hotspot, but walk through the French Quarter today and you might just change your mind. Well, now when I was a young boy. Some say it's the beautiful weather. Others say it's the unique character of the city. Fact is, thousands of tourists chose New Orleans as their getaway this holiday weekend. Oh, we wanted to have some fun, eat some Cajun food. Ride the carriage. Oh, yes. It's wonderful. We recommend it to all friends. I've never been here before. It was fun. Live, awesome music, blues and jazz. <laughs> Used to be New Orleans became somewhat deserted around Easter time. A lot of tourists didn't really flock here, and a lot of locals left town on vacation. Well, one look behind me just proves that that's all changed. And French Quarter merchants couldn't be happier. The head of the Bourbon Street Business Association says he's seen a big increase in crowds compared to years past. Because New Orleans is such a fun place, I've noticed that all of our holiday periods are up. And uh, Easter in the past uh, was not such a great weekend, but more and more people love to come to New Orleans, and they're discovering that it's a great place to come any time of the year. As if we need it, it's just one more reason for New Orleans to throw a party. Give it up! Two, 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 give it up! Two, two, Reporting from the French Quarter, Kim Holden, News 8. We were curious about the spill's effects, so we asked Elaine Quijano to look into it. You can't spill that much oil into a system without having long-term negative consequences. David Muth is with the advocacy group, the National Wildlife Federation. He took us to an island where weeks after the spill, pelicans were covered with oil. Muth says oil is suffocating mangroves holding the soil in place. It was four acres before. How big is the island now? It's less than an acre. Seventy-five percent loss of, of the island since, since the spill. What do you think this will look like in another two years? Gone. Completely gone? Completely gone. Two years later, the oil is still here in some parts of these marshlands. You can actually see it in places in these tar patches. And in other areas, the ground is so saturated, you can actually see the oil bubbling up from the ground. BP says it's committed to the largest and most complex study of the Gulf ever done. It's a study with high stakes for all involved. Elaine Quijano, CBS News, Barataria Bay, Louisiana. And what we're going to do is we're going to play follow the leader, and we're going to attempt to do the barrel pattern. They are young kids who share more than a love of horses. Come on, Jesse. Many of these kids have blood diseases or cancer. This camp is not only for the kids who have health problems, but also for kids like Tyler, whose brother has cancer. This gives both of them a chance to interact and do the things that kids would like to do. In all, 110 campers are here. And for this one week, they're able to be just a normal, regular kid like everybody else. Roxanne Manette lost her daughter Leslie to cancer two years ago. She used to bring Leslie here as a patient. 
Roxanne now comes here to volunteer and to remember. They made little picture frames and they took a Polaroid snapshot and they put it inside the frame and they decorated it with seashells and colored sand and some little tile blocks. And that is the last picture I have of her at camp. It was in 1995 that they did that. And it's a memory that I always will treasure. There you go. Watch their faces and you'll see that Camp Challenge may be the best medicine most have had in years. So says Carl Klutz, known around here as Chief. Klutz is a cancer survivor. Uh, matter of fact, one of the reverends uh, giving me my last rites. He beat the disease twice, first at age four, then at age nine. Now he inspires others walking that same long, difficult road. It really makes me cry. See all these children. What really hurts is the children that will come back. Give everybody a big camp challenge. Hello there. Hey. Kevin Brun is seven and has cancer. Right. So does 10-year-old Jessica Gillespie. But their energy is contagious. What no one can understand is how kids so young and so cute can be so sick. Emerson once wrote, where there is life, there is danger. To these kids at Camp Challenge, that danger feels a million miles away. Near Independence, George Ryan, Fox News 8. Along parts of Highway 90, there's an assembly line. 128 inmates from Dixon Correctional Institute are making a levy. They hope to build a mile a day. Water's been on the road for 13 days. Between Des Almonds and Raceland, remnants of Tropical Storm Francis just won't go away. This mess has been going on for the last three years. Should have got this thing fixed by now. While it's not South hurricane evacuation route, officials say it needs to be dry. You never can tell when you may have to use this in, in a situation where this may have to be utilized by emergency vehicles or what have you during any type of uh, you know disaster or hurricane situation. The makeshift levee is about two and a half feet tall, and officials say if George should come our way, it should be enough to keep the water off the road. Inmates will fill 25,000 sandbags a day. They'll do it round the clock. The four and a half mile job is expected to take 140,000 sandbags. And if the weather holds out, it could be finished by Sunday. If we get more rain, you get some rain showers, that kind of hampers a little bit. But as long as we can keep some dry weather, that'll also help. Sandbags will be going down the line from sunup to sundown. Highway 90 should be good to go in the event of an emergency. For 13 years, the words no swimming and Tangipaho River have gone hand in hand, but not for long. The river is so clean and clear. For more than 20 years, Shirley Wells and her family operated Ponchatoula Beach, a summer getaway for campers and swimmers right on the Tangipaho River. She closed the beach for personal reasons in 1985. She says it's time for the no swimming signs to come down. Right now, we want the river opened uh, because we think it's clean from the testing that we did uh, monthly, every month for 10 years. It looks like Shirley could get her wish. A summer's worth of sampling around certain parts of the river show it's ready for swimmers. And that's good news for the tubing industry. The tubing industry in Tangipaho was over a million and a half, almost a $2 million industry in the late 1980s. And that completely disappeared. So there are a good number of people who actually think that it may not come back initially, but uh, I think down the line we'll see a lot of recreational activity, hopefully on the Tangipaho and potentially other rivers in the area. One site in particular near a meet met both state and federal guidelines for recreation swimming. The parish council will have the last say on whether these signs can come down. But another sign may go up, warning swimmers to stay out after a rain. It's been a dry summer, so we haven't had a lot of rainfall runoff. But I think whenever we see a lot of rain, we'll still get a spike of pollution going in the river. Along Highway 21 between Covington and Bogalusa, the small town of Bush. 
There's so much division and strife now that I don't think it can be rectified by anybody. Inside its lone gas station, the unsettled presidential election is the talk of the town. There's no solution in revoting. And, and if you couldn't understand the ballot, you should have asked for help. Even though this tiny community is called Bush, don't make the mistake of assuming it's all George Bush country. The Republicans made the money and the poor people didn't have nothing. It's, and, and people are going to regret, one of these days they're going to regret if they go Republican now. The lunchtime crowd had a strong appetite for different opinions on the presidential election still hinging on Florida's vote count. This got me all shook up. I don't really know what's going on, you know. Adrian Quay voted for Bush, and he's proud of it. You think your guy won it fair and square? <laughs> hmm. that's, a, that's, that's a hard situation to figure out. Across the table, a gore man. The ballot should have been better. It was up to the governor to see if the ballot was better. In South Florida, this so-called butterfly ballot is getting the blame for confusing voters in a heavily Democratic area. But people in Bush, Louisiana, can't settle on how far the fight over who gets to claim Florida's electoral votes should go. I don't think the court should decide on the election. The people should. Why, why wouldn't Bush concede? I think Bush is going to win, regardless, but I don't think Bush should uh, give up. I don't vote for none of them. You didn't vote? No. <laughs> Why didn't you vote? Because they're all crooks. That's the worst thing you can do. Then you don't, it's like not belong. Fire trucks raced to the scene. Fierce flames poured from the windows of the third floor of the building. Firemen on ladders tried to reach the flames, but were quickly turned back by the raging fire. When they busted the window out, the one guy, the fire rolled across. Him. By all accounts, the fire that only reached two alarms put a strain on firefighters whose own safety was at stake. About 15 to 20 minutes after our initial attack, I pulled everybody out of the building. From that point in time, we used master streams on a building. A bellhop at the Queen Crescent Hotel, located only two buildings from the fire scene, called the fire department. Well, we had guests that came in the hotel that reported there was a fire on Camp and Porges. So the first thing I did is call 911. The flames were so hot, alarms in the hotel went off, prompting an evacuation. It smelled pretty smoky up on the sixth floor. So it, there's been a lot of smoke and. Uh, blowing down that way and they, they handled it real well. Thick smoke blanketed sections of the CBD. Police blocked off sections of Poitras near Camp Street. As firefighters trained water on the building, scores of spectators looked on. Some spotted the flames from miles away. We saw smoke when we were coming over the Crescent City Connection and so we decided to come check it out. Once the flames were out, water poured from openings in the gutted building and weary firemen tried to cool off. But for fire officials, the big concern remains the build instability. Interior beams were burned to a crisp in some sections. We're not sure if this building's gonna be stable or not. The parade was just about to roll shortly past noon today when a float loaded with riders turned into a roaring inferno. Witnesses say they heard an explosion. In the beginning, I thought it was fireworks because it sounded like fireworks. And then when I turned around, I just saw the flames coming out of the back. And that's when everybody started running and screaming. They went to just jump in and, you know, people went to panicking. Myself, we went to the back door and just tried to help everybody out. Six people were injured. Some had minor burns. Others had sprains and bruises from jumping from the float. None of the injuries were serious. The float was sponsored by a club called Family Fanatics and was loaded with more than a dozen children. We had a few kids on and we had to throw them off the side and we got out the back part of it. People were getting people over the railings and dragging people out and somebody got the babies out of the baby seats. Thank God. We have, I mean, people were very good. Although firefighters have not pinpointed the cause, they're looking at an electrical generator aboard the float that had just been started up minutes before the blaze broke out. It started smelling gas, and before we knew it, it just, whoo, it just went into an explosion. So apparently, I think it was the generator closed in, and the ventilation got out, you know. After the fire, the parade went on anyway, with floats detouring around the burned-out wreckage. 
Riders on the remaining floats try to make the best of their Mardi Gras, but those who escaped the Family Fanatics float were just happy to be alive. Reporting from the City Park area, John Huffman, News 8. Why are we in Louisiana again? America's number one television oh, family. Yeah. Duck Dynasty's Willie oh, yeah. and Corey. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's a work well, day, fun. but we want to see America's first family in action. Can we see you in action? Come on in. <laughs> all right, here's the office. Uh, this is where all the big deals happen. This is where we started. This is my man in his element. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wolf man. That's in his right. Element. Are you tracking a terrorist or a deer? <laughs> I could do either, but uh, that particular time was a deer. Now, if you saw that in the woods coming at you, you'd be frightened, right? I'm frightened now. Yeah. <laughs>